Well, I'll switch into English. Uh, it's always hard for me, uh, from Czech to English, you know. But the next speaker is Jürgen Apollo. Uh, but before he comes to the stage, uh, he told me a few facts about his personality or himself. Uh, based on Jürgen's judgment, he should be the only Dutch who hates football. It's his judgment, but you know. Another interesting fact, and I Google it, like the Time magazine from 69, he was born on the very same day when Apple landed on the moon. So Google it, it's a nice cover from Time magazine. Not the Jürgen, but he's a star, you know. <laughs> and uh, one, uh, one other thing uh, that makes him happy, you know, I always ask people, uh, what makes you happy, like in the past week or today? And uh, Jürgen has a nice experience from yesterday from a small Korean-Japanese restaurant which was very cute, small and comfortable and that makes him happy. So you can, uh, you know, hang around and ask about the tips for the restaurant in Pazen. So welcome Jürgen, he's going to speak about the Anfix model. All right, all of it is true, indeed. And the funny thing is, when my mother was in the hospital in labor trying to give birth to her first son, the whole world was watching television with the first man setting step on the moon. And uh, that uh, thing up there was called the Apollo. Well, guess what? My name is Apollo. It's very similar. <laughs> so, as a coincidence, I'm sure. Anyways, there's nothing worse for a keynote speaker than being after someone else who was funny. Okay. I hate that. Because <laughs> it means now I have to do work. <laughs> now I have to put some effort in. No. Um, but don't worry, I'm not going to make you do the wave or I'm not going to make you clap or sing or something, okay? I'm, I'm just going to make you cry. I'm just going to make you cry. Um, the Scaled Agile Framework, I'm sure some of you have heard of it, has a net promoter score of minus 56. Please don't kill yourself yet. <laughs> but it is rather, rather bad. <laughs> minus 56. It is maybe the most hated thing and also the most popular thing at the same time in the Agile community. And uh, I'm not sure why you are all here, but Agile is dead, according to Facebook, okay? <laughs> why are you having this conference? I don't know. Because <laughs> Facebook said, uh, Facebook is true. <laughs> all these messages of Agile being that McKinsey just killed it, oh my God. <laughs> um, well, Agile might be dead, but agility is not. Okay, let's, let's cling on to that one. Um, so we have a few problems, I think, in the, uh, in the Agile world. And um, another problem, I think, is that there's no model or framework that covers HR or marketing or finance or portfolio a little bit with SAFE. But many parts of the company are still forgotten, uh, in, my, uh, in my opinion. So we have to do something about that. Well, fortunately, some people, some companies show us the way. I was a very, I've had a very interesting company 10 years ago in China, in Qingdao, which is in the uh, uh, far uh, east, northeast of the country uh, at the sea. I met Mr. Zhang, who is the CEO, and he wrote the foreword for the Chinese translation of my book, which is awesome. I was very proud of that. And this is a very interesting company. <clears throat> I will show, I will tell you in a moment. But um, first, a funny anecdote. I did my management three row course there with 25 Chinese managers in the room. There were three big cameras in the back of the room recording everything. They probably copied everything and did the same thing a hundred times. I didn't care. It was a great experience. And I had an interpreter next to me who was translating every sentence that I spoke in real time. So it was a little bit slow. And I'm the kind of person who likes 
cracking a joke every now and then in my, in my workshops. I mean, it has to be fun. And people were always laughing when I made a joke. And at one point I thought, hmm, this is suspicious. <laughs> They're always laughing when I make a joke. <laughs> after the interpreter translated. So I said uh, after the course, uh, uh, during dinner, I'd asked him, so what do you do when my English cannot easily be translated to Chinese when I make a joke? Because people were always laughing. Um, and he always called me Professor Jurgen. I didn't mind. <laughs> I didn't mind. That, that, was, that, was, that was okay. That was okay with me. So um, he said, well, in that case, I tell the people in the room, uh, Professor Jurgen just made a joke, please laugh. <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> and I think he was serious. <laughs> Anyways, Hire is an amazing company. Hire is 4,000 self-organizing autonomous units. They call them micro-enterprises. They are a network not a hierarchy, they are a horizontal network of 80,000 people or something like that. Imagine that, 4,000 units of about 15, 20 people. They are the largest uh, home appliance brand in the world. They're called the most creatively managed company in the world and the most valuable Internet of Things company in the world. Here's a, a little video explaining a little bit. The most eye-catching element of Hire's reinvention is the change in organizational structure. The hierarchical pyramid was pulled down and replaced with a network of more than 4,000 highly autonomous micro-enterprises. Typically, a micro-enterprise employs 10 to 15 people and functions as a separate business. These independent units contract with one another to deliver products and services. Imagine that, and I was already, they were already working on that when I was there 10 years ago. They just switched to 3,000 micro enterprises. And they asked me for advice. <laughs> I was like, whoa, I've never seen anything like this. I'm glad that they paid me. I should have paid them <laughs> for the inspiration uh, that they gave me. Um, but anyways, um, what I learned from that, that this is possible. You can be a network of tiny businesses that collaborate and compete, but it's a lot of collaboration in that network. The question is, how do you organize things? Well, let's talk about that. Um, I have uh, found some patterns of how to make these micro enterprises work, uh, how, to, uh, how to have a collection of tribes or bases. That's actually the first pattern, the base. I call that the base because it's the, the, the home where people feel safe and at home. Uh, you can call it a tribe or a business unit or a micro enterprise, that, that makes no difference to me. But um, it, is, it is important that people have a small group of, 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 of colleagues that they feel safe with. Psychological safety is a big thing nowadays in the Agile community. And uh, I remember a long time ago when I was working for a big company of 4,000 people, I didn't know anyone in the company. And I only knew my four team members and we were rented out to some customer to do a project. And the only person I knew was my manager. And that was it. So I quit after a year. It was the most boring organization I have ever worked with. I had no base. I had no home of people that I felt that I belonged, uh, belonged to. So that's the first pattern. You need to have a small number of people. That, that everyone feels that they belong to. It could be a few dozen, maybe a hundred, but not 4,000. That's not going to work. Then the next pattern is the crew. Of course, the team. Everyone understands what teamwork is about. I like the word crew because a crew is about a temporary mission that you're on together. I, I prefer that word, but you can call them team if you want, or squad, or pod, I don't care. And I don't need to explain, but the typical pattern in the Agile community is, of course, the value stream crew, right? That's the Scrum team, Kanban team, Agile team, Feature team. We have lots of words for it, but it all means the same thing. They have the responsibility for the value stream. That's the yellow ones in this, in this model. No need to explain this. However, 
there are some exceptions. Sometimes you have a team that goes across the others. That could be maybe a few product owners, maybe a few scrum masters uh, that feel that they are teamed together. They do not have their own backlog, but they help the others with their backlog so that they can deliver work to the customers. I call that a facilitation crew. That's the name of the pattern that I give to that. There's another exception to the rule, which is the rare talents the people who have some special skills that you cannot simply distribute across all your scrum teams or agile teams. You have 10 agile teams and you have only two cybersecurity experts or only three um, machine learning specialists. How do they divide their work across 10 scrum teams? Well, in that case, it is okay to have them form their own little team and have their capabilities available to the others on an on-demand basis. Because not every team needs machine learning all the time. There's not enough work for them across the 10 different teams. So they form their own little unit and they sort of hover, hover around. I call that the capability crew. And the next pattern I found is, uh, is the platform crew. A bit controversial in the parts of the agile world, particularly with people who are from the uh, less framework, large-scale scrum. But some say they have found it beneficial if a couple of people take care of the infrastructure, of the architecture of stuff, so that Others can be faster with their continuous deployments and everything. It's basically like being a supplier. It's like being a vendor. You offer a platform for the others to run on. It's you, with a service level agreement, maybe even an API. So that's the platform crew. Sometimes you need a team like that. Now, all of this is stolen, sorry, borrowed from this book. Okay? <laughs> it's a great book. Uh, team Topologies by Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pais, they identify these four patterns that seem very useful. Most teams should be the yellow ones, the agile teams, right? the end-to-end -end stream aligned teams, but there are exceptions. For good reason, sometimes we have one of the other three. They just use different words because, to be honest, complicated subsystem team it is not a word that easily rolls off the tongue. So capability, that's, that's what it is about, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But then things change. I have some things to add to these patterns, and I have good reasons for that. You may have heard of uh, Dutch bank ING. They're pretty popular. They're actually famous for successfully implementing their version of the Spotify model, it is said. And they're pretty agile. I'm a customer of ING, quite happy. I notice it with the app, good app. Website, pretty good. However, I was annoyed two weeks ago. I have a new phone, ta-da, my beautiful Pixel 6 phone that I purchased uh, three weeks ago. And um, uh, recently, I, on the weekend, I had to uh, uh, pay, for, uh, uh, pay for something, pay for an invoice. And you know how it is with a new phone. You spend an entire week re-authenticating on every freaking app on the entire phone. It drives you completely nuts. So the first time you use the bank app, oh God, I have to log in, of course, because it's a new phone. So I log in on the phone and it says, uh, your password is expired. Oh, God. Yeah, because ING, for some reason, wants me to change my password every three months. No freaking clue why, but that's the way it is. So the app sends me to the website. Okay, so on the website, I enter my old password, new password, new password again, submit, and then it says, you need to validate this on your phone. Yeah, okay, but my phone doesn't work. <laughs> I can't log in. <laughs> To log in, I have to go to the website, change my password. Okay, but to change my password, I have to first validate my phone. And I was, I was stuck. <laughs> I was stuck between the app and between the, between the website. And fortunately, I'm not stupid. <laughs> 
So I took out the SIM, put it back in my old phone where I still had an activated app, changed my password there, took my SIM out, put it in a new phone, and then the, I solved the dilemma. It took me half an hour, and I was pissed off. <laughs> As you can imagine, I have better things to do. <laughs> For half an hour of work to just pay one invoice. Now, this is typical in the Agile world. Because, as Clayton Christensen said, new products succeed not because of the features and functionality they offer, but because of the experiences they enable. And this was a bad experience. It was not fun. And Kathy Shera, a game designer, said, the secret to building great products is making awesome users, not making awesome features. And guess what? We are often talking about feature teams and product backlogs and product roadmaps and product managers and product owners. It's products everywhere. But who cares about the experience? That's something else. From this book, Network Scale and Agile, I've, I have this interesting quote. The examples abound of the crippling effects uh, of agile business units that cannot work together to deliver a complete customer experience at the enterprise level. Indeed, phone sends me to the website. Website sends me to the phone. I could have spent all day and not solved it. <laughs> that, was, that was the experience. of The app was great, website great. Still, the experience is a problem. For that reason, uh, and I see great companies doing this, some should care about the experience of the users and the customers across the various teams. They call that customer journey mapping, service design, design thinking. There's lots of communities out there who know all about experience, not products, not features. What makes the customer happier? It's the little things sometimes. And I call that the experience crew. They're like a special version, maybe, of the facilitation group, but they really focus on, on, on the front end and figure out, why was Jürgen so frustrated with us? <laughs> Can we fi figure that out in, in, in the data somehow? Um, but I have another one that I want to add. By the way, has anyone ever heard of the purple crocodile? Probably not, no. It's a typical Dutch expression, yeah. The thing is, uh, uh, many years ago, there was a, a very popular commercial on Dutch television about a lady who came to the swimming pool with her daughter, and she said her daughter had forgotten, left her purple crocodile last uh, uh, yesterday. Can she please get the purple crocodile back? I will show you the video. It's in Dutch, but it doesn't matter, okay? My daughter is yesterday her paarse crocodile vergeten. Paarse crocodile. Perfect. In blokletters, de juiste locatie voor de vermissing, et cetera, et cetera. Zo. Achterkant. So what happens is, the purple crocodile is standing there. Can we have it back? He says, he grabs a form. Please fill this out. And then, other side. And then when she filled out the other side, he says, now you have to return this tomorrow between 8 and 9 at the lost and found department. People love this commercial. <laughs> and since then, anything that smells of bureaucracy is called purple crocodile in our country. Oh my God, another purple crocodile. <laughs> so you know what Dutch people refer to when they're talking of purple crocodiles. And I see purple crocodiles everywhere, everywhere. Recently, I, um, I was uh, planning to, to do business with a large social network. They asked me for some learning uh, videos. Um, I will not tell them which, which social network it was, but let's pretend that they're called Twatter, for example. Okay? Twatter. Anonymous, anonymous social network. So Twitter uh, wanted some videos of me, and they said, um, uh, but we need a couple of documents. <sighs> purple crocodile, purple crocodile. Okay, zen, zen. I'll do it. <laughs> okay, the independent contractor agreement, ICA, statement of work, code of conduct, MNDA, security one, W9 form. So I filled it all out. And I said, by the way, W9 is incorrect because uh, I'm a foreigner. 
uh, it should be W-A-B-E-N for enterprises, because I know I've done business with American companies before. My publishers are American businesses, so I know this is the, not the right form. So I gave them the W-8, which they actually needed. And then they were like, oh, you're not American. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, we need these documents. <laughs> Really? <laughs> VAT registration, certificate of good conduct. They wanted a copy of my last tax return. What? The, the, a copy of passport, supplier contact. Sheet. I said, no. No, I'm not going to do this. It's, it's a day of work. Just, to, just to, for the privilege of working with you, screw you. No, I fired them. <laughs> I fired them. I'm not here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Find someone else, someone else to jump through all these, or to throw all these purple crocodiles at. I'm not going to do that. So, um, I find this is a problem still in the, in the business world out there, that we mistreat our suppliers and our vendors and our freelancers and our gig, gig workers that today. I have done business with American companies. The only thing they need is the W-8 and that's it. Fine, all right, fill it out. I have standard copies lying around and then we can do business. All the rest is just nonsense. So the experience economy coincides with the gig economy. And that's why I have another one, the partnership crew, because some people should care about the experience of your vendors, of your suppliers, of your partners, the people that you're working with. And you don't need it in all cases, but I can imagine a company such as Netflix, for example, they have to deal with TV show producers that would like a good experience of working with Netflix because they have plenty other streaming services to choose from nowadays. Oh, if you don't treat me well, fine, I will go with Amazon Prime. <laughs> they might treat me better and my TV show on your platform. So that's the, uh, that's the experience crew on the partnership side. But there's a bit more. Um, a forum is a place to talk and make important decisions. You know, a guild, community of practice, committee, maybe. Sometimes you just have to get together across the various crews and talk about stuff with, the, with each other. Fair enough. So a forum is a place to talk and, and to decide. And now the last, and maybe for some, the most important ones, because I, I was there and I saw, at one point, the managers won from the Scrum Masters. Did you see that? Yeah, I was like, yes! <laughs> and then the Scrum Masters were up again. Oh, okay, whatever. But anyway, there were just about many Scrum Masters and managers uh, here, here in the room. Well, where do the managers go? They go over there at the top. Is there a laser pointer here in the thing? No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't really work as well. All right, it doesn't matter. So the governance crew over there, that's the management team. The blue one. I have it blue because management 3.0 is also uh, blue uh, as, uh, in its house uh, style. The governance crew is the management team. And they should only be there, nowhere else. And that's a bit of a problem with the scaled agile framework and less and some other models. They try not to touch the management reporting lines. I say, well, you can, you can introduce this without changing any direct reports. Just, uh, just overlay it on your current, uh, current organizational uh, uh, design as a, as a dual operating system. Well, <laughs> good luck with that because then the managers could be anywhere. <laughs> they could be on the same scrum team even. <laughs> they could be in completely different parts of the organization. You could have a matrix organization even. Ooh, I have lived in a matrix organization. It was a, a bit annoying. I had my functional manager over there in that part of the company. I had a project manager over there in that part of the company that I had to report to. In some businesses, they even have a regional manager that they also need to report to. That's a lot of management. <laughs> One criticism of matrix structures that it leads to lots of managers coordinating stuff with each other in the middle management layers. But there's another problem that I found in, in this book about organization design. One key finding is that lower level managers are unable to resolve conflicts. And they just, just 
bubble up the problems to the next higher manager, management layers. So the functional manager and the project manager, they don't even know each other, so they cannot solve the problem, and they're like, okay, whatever, <laughs> and up the, the, the problem goes. It's like an, an uncaught exception in programming that just be, keeps being raised until it blows up your entire, entire architecture. So an unintended consequence of the matrix structure is that it, is, it makes the organization more centralized. Isn't that interesting? We introduce an agile framework, we want a decentralized company, local decision making with agile teams, but if we don't solve the management reporting lines problem, you may end up with a matrix structure which makes everything more centralized actually in decision making. I had someone like that in my workshop a couple of months ago, he said, yeah, that's what we have. We have the CEO making decisions about the silliest things on the scrum teams because we have a matrix and all the problems are <laughs> thrown up uh, to the higher levels. So try not to have a matrix organization. I prefer managers up there in the blue box and no matter where you work in the base, in the tribe, in those crews, those are very flexible, you can change them anytime. Everyone has their manager in the blue box. And they are a team. They should be able to solve problems with each other. Hire also does not have a matrix organization. Everyone in a microenterprise has their manager up there in the microenterprise. They can solve the problems that no problems are escalated up in any matrix. Now, there's something else that I find interesting. Sometimes teams have to be formed fast. I read an article about uh, news crews uh, from the BBC or something it, it was. Imagine that there's something, something happens in the city, something terrible happens, or maybe something good happens, but usually something terrible, because mostly something terrible happens, not never something good, I don't know why, but always terrible things happening. And uh, we need a new news item for the news at 8 o'clock, so we send a crew there, right? We send a cameraman and a sound engineer and an interviewer, and they have to go and make a news item and deliver it, finished, polished, so we can broadcast at 8 o'clock. Right? Do you think that team has time to do some trust exercises? Do you think they have time for forming, storming, norming, performing? No. <laughs> they have to hit the ground running. <laughs> they have to form a team right there within a few minutes and get their stuff going, right? They are professionals. They should know how to work with each other already. They should have learned this. It is the same in fire departments, in hospitals, at airlines, whatever. People form crews in any combination, they already know how to work with each other because the stuff that they're working with is the same. It's the same cameras, it's the same sound system, it's the same fire truck, it's the same operating room. They are trained to use that and then they can form a team in different combinations. We call that reteaming. And there are benefits to reteaming. I always promote this book by Heidi Helfand, Dynamic Reteaming. She describes the various versions of reteaming, the reasons to reteaming. One reason is, for example, that so many things change in the world outside that we have to be able to respond faster to new risks and new opportunities, whether it is another virus outbreak, another war, another supply chain problem, another inflation issue, whatever. There's always something going on nowadays, right? We need to respond faster and that requires us to reform uh, as teams. But also, it increases the employee experience. And when people are able to work in different combinations, learn different things, meet new people, and just not be stuck on the same team with the same stuff forever. And literally, it, that's what it says on the website of less large-scale scrum. Your teams should preferably stay together forever. <laughs> Imagine that, <laughs> oh my God. The fear <laughs> I would have <laughs> of being with the same people forever. <laughs> no, I don't want that. 
I want a bit of variety in, the, in my job. So um, there's this guy, Martin Fowler, who had this uh, wonderful quote, his favorite quote, if it hurts, do it more often. And he, uh, he talked about releases, software releases. And I am so old that I remember in the 90s, we shipped software on disks, first diskettes and then CDs, and oh my God, that was painful. Do some of you remember that? <laughs> My God, that was such a pain. And then you release your software, and then the very next day you found a bug. Oh my God. <laughs> then you had to do a bug fix release after it, and it's, it, it never stopped. And then he said, they, with, with his Agile fellows in the Agile Manifesto, you know what? You should do that more often. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because if you do it more often, you will find out why it hurts and you will solve those pains and you make it easier. So you release every month and then every week and then every day and then multiple times per day. That's where we are now, continuous deployments. It's easy for some companies uh, now. They've solved all the pains. Well, for a long time, I've been part of the Agile community and people said, don't change your teams because that will destroy their velocity, that's going to hurt their throughput and performance, it will, it will be painful. Then we do it more often <laughs> and figure out why it hurts. And we solve those problems, right? They already solve this in other industries. We're not like leading here. Uh, this is, we're the laggards figuring out how to do reteaming. <clears throat> That's why I say I have this pattern, I call it a turf. You need, you need something that is the same so that it is easy for everyone to do reteaming. That's why airlines love specializing with one airplane. They prefer to have only one type of plane because that makes the reteaming easier. It's the same in hospitals. The hospital rooms look exactly the same so that everyone knows where, where everything is. We need to learn from that. And then enjoy the benefits of reteaming. So, um, a couple of examples. This would be uh, safe or less uh, drawn in uh, what I call the unfixed model. The, we have the, the yellow agile teams and then maybe the purple product owners and agile coaches. Maybe a guild behind a back-end guild or a front-end guild or something. And there should be a management team up there. That is a typical example of what I call a fully integrated base. Everyone is making one thing together. But I can show you more options. This could be a microservices business um, with a couple of independent teams that release any time they want. They're not stuck in the same cadence. They have microservices uh, with different kinds of features that they focus on. Probably they have a platform team offering them infrastructure and DevOps uh, services to make those continuous deployments easier for everyone. Maybe they have an experience theme on the customer side and on the supplier side that would be typical for a company such as Spotify or Netflix or something. What about an outsourcing business? You know the ones. Often in Western Europe, they send projects to Eastern Europe or even further to India because uh, labor is cheaper still in those countries. And then these companies do uh, have, have a lot of projects going on for different customers. That means they have different backlogs. They have no dependencies. The only dependency is the people themselves. So you need a bit of project management or account management uh, deciding who works for which customer when. You know the problem. So those are typical uh, purple, um, um, purple uh, teams. And maybe some specialists in machine learning or cybersecurity or, or whatever. Those would be a capability crew. And the last example would be um, uh, an incubator in a larger business. Imagine an R&D department where they have multiple teams trying to come up with new innovations. They could actually compete with each other. Who is the first who can solve this problem? It's a friendly competition. That's an incubator. And the management team is an investment team, actually. They invest in the new ideas. And may the best one win. That's a fully segregated base. 
But still, same patterns, agile teams, capability crews, probably a customer experience team who knows how to run minimal viable products and help the teams run these tests on the bigger customer base of the, of the larger enterprise. And some shared services with mentoring of the startup founders and, and, st and stuff. This is Anders, a friend of mine. Anders Iverson, one of the co-authors of the Spotify model, he said the Unfix model pinpoints many of the problems we saw and mostly fixed at Spotify. Specifically, it provides some flexibility uh, about, uh, about scaling diff to different organizations. Ooh, that would be interesting. So, we nailed it. When I, know, I know how to make a micro-enterprise, but how to have 4,000 of them? Well, same patterns. That's how Hire works, exactly the same patterns. They have these 4,000 businesses, these 4,000 small bases, micro-enterprises. Guess what? <clears throat> Some of them offer platform services. They offer infrastructure to the others. Some of them have special capabilities. They're like capability micro-enterprises. They offer special talent to the others on an as-needed basis. A few of them do facilitation. Some micro-enterprises have as their job to help the others find each other because with 4,000 bases, it's impossible to know them all. So some are the glue between the others because higher makes vacuum cleaners, um, uh, air conditioning, game computers. You cannot do that with 15 people. You'll, ha you'll need a few others to, to do this. So they continuously reorganize into these yellow value streams where they make these products with multiple units, multiple micro-enterprises. And some micro-enterprises are there simply to help. Those, those are the purple ones. And they also have the yellow ones and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the pink ones focusing on customer experience. It is the same patterns, only at the next higher level. So I was there 10 years ago. And uh, what was funny was when I was picked up from the airport in a limousine, that was super cool, they treated me as a, a celebrity. I sat in the taxi and I looked sideways and I saw a little a sticker of two nearly naked boys, like this, and uh, one of them with his thumb up and the other with the ice cream. Uh, okay, interesting. <laughs> so I sort of tried to take a picture of it sending it to my husband back home in the Netherlands. Fascinating country over here. <laughs> but anyways, so we went to the headquarters of Hire, and guess what? Out of the window of the taxi, I saw a huge statue. <laughs> a huge statue of the naked boys. And, and the interpreter in my taxi said, do you like it? This is our company logo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you want to know the story? Yes, I do. <laughs> Tell me the story about the logo. <laughs> this sounds fun. So the story of the logo is that Hire was started as a company making fridges, refrigerators, the ice cream. Right? And they typically make the refrigerators for Western European co uh, companies, the white boy, right? who is the customer. And Hire, as the Asian boy, is uh, on the beach because Hire lives in Qingdao, which is on the beach. They're famous for their beaches, which is why they're wearing swimming trunks. <laughs> that's it, that's the story, and I loved it. <laughs> that's the story of the logo. It doesn't translate well to a European audience, <laughs> but that's okay, right? That's fine. We now understand what the story is about. We, we understand what the picture means, and they, they create high-quality products. That's why the thumb is up. We create good refrigerators, not bad ones, good ones, for our customers in Europe, <laughs> so that they can have ice cream. <laughs> I love it. So, but this is, this is a reminder that uh, visuals can be confusing sometimes. We need to understand how the visuals got together, why pictures are drawn that way. But it is a job for us to understand what is the meaning behind it, what are the principles. And I can only admire Hire for everything that they've done and they have revolutionized the way companies are being organized. They are the, 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 uh, the example of how to, uh, <coughs> uh, 
how to run in an, uh, how to run a business as a as a network. So I have uh, I have templates, a Miro template available for those who want to play with them uh, with the unfix uh, elements. Uh, people from all over the world trying to uh, make, create their own experiments, make their own pictures, and uh, and the whole idea is that it should feel like Lego. Are there any fans of Lego here in the room? Let me let me see some hands. The Lego fans, yay! Lego is cool, right? Are there also any fans of Playmobil in the room? Boo! Boo! He's over there! Kill him! Kill him! <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> when I was young, I loved, I loved Lego, okay? But I, would, I had a big box of Lego bricks. And my brother was into Playmobil. I didn't get it. I didn't understand what was so fun about Playmobil. It was so boring for me. Because with Playmobil, you got the whole house out of the box, and that was it. And then you could move your figures around or something. Maybe you could replace one or two items, but that was it. You, you had to play with the house. But when I got a Lego house, first I had to build it myself. <laughs> into the Lego house, according to the picture. But the next day, if I got bored, I just broke it down. And I made it into a spaceship. <laughs> and that was much more fun. I, who cared about the house? I had a spaceship, which was cooler, or an air jet, or, or a train, or, or whatever. And for me, that is a little bit the difference between, between, uh, between frameworks and pattern libraries. I call unfix and pattern library. Other examples are liberating structures or um, the Scrum pattern library of practices, Scrum plop <laughs> it is called. Uh, there are lots of pattern libraries out there. A framework, the word itself, framework, suggests that there is something rigid, something static that everything else depends on and you cannot change the static thing that is the framework. That is what the language means. And this is often not intended by people who create the frameworks, but that is often how it is interpreted by people who use the framework, because that is what the word itself means. Right? It means that this static thing, you cannot touch it. It's actually even in the Scrum Guide, or previous version of the Scrum, I don't know if they still have it, but this is Scrum, as defined it is Scrum. If you change anything, fine, but then it's not Scrum anymore. You destroyed the framework, basically. And um, yeah, so I find that important with, um, uh, with the unfixed model that you find it, you see there's a pattern library that is not uh, a framework, but you use it as a Lego, uh, Lego box. I have a few minutes left. Uh, uh, three minutes left, I see. Um, I wanted to, uh, uh, one thing that I skipped with, um, uh, with dynamic reteaming that I now have time for is uh, that this is not something new. If you want to change your teams continuously, you have, uh, you have different options. At Redgate Software, for example, um, they change their teams or they allow teams to change once per year. So once per year, they have an, an, they have an annual event uh, where uh, people can volunteer to work on another team. And about one-third of the team members choose voluntarily to work somewhere else. They have sort of a marketplace going on, and then they say, yeah, I would like to work somewhere else, fun, new technologies to work on. Yes, the velocity drops a little bit for a week or two, but customers don't really notice. And team members are happy with the chance of choosing to work with other team members. And about one-third of people do that once per year. That's a sort of an easy version. On the other extreme, we have Tesla. At Tesla, they do reteaming every three hours. Imagine that. Every three hours, people work on another team at a factory plant. So they have a large backlog of stuff to do, small tasks determined by the AI, the machine learning. <laughs> That's computers giving instructions to people <laughs> instead of the other way around. <laughs> the backlog comes from machine learning. They know what the next important things are to do. And then people volunteer to 
sign up to some of the tasks and they find others. Who wants to work on that one? Oh, I want to work on that one. Okay, the next three hours we're going to work on this little thing. And that every three hours it changes, the grouping. So Joe Justice, who is famous in the agile community of extreme manufacturing, he has worked at Tesla for, a, a, for quite a while and he said, learning goes through the roof. Within a few weeks, you've worked with almost everyone in the entire plant at, at Tesla. You know everything that is going on, from paint to coding to, to wheels and, and, and whatnot. That's the other extreme of reteaming. There are many options in between, right? The most important thing is reteaming is about people volunteering, vol volunteering to work on something so that they decide this looks fun. This is something that I think I can contribute to or something that I can learn from. Can I please join this particular thing? Because that would be cool. It is not project managers moving people around. That's not this, what, what reteaming is about. So that's what I wanted to share about reteaming. I see my time is up. Um, I hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of the conference here at InAgile. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. And uh, have a great day. Thank you.